just so you know, I've had people that they read my book, but then when they listened to you do the audio on it, said, oh my gosh, this is this is so real life now. I really, really feel involved with it. And so I'm doing this because I'm not just plugging my audio book, but our audio book. It's because it really helps the story. It really helps tell it in a way that people can go, wow, I can take that and actually seek more answers and actually see the line of thinking with this. So, yeah, thank you. You're the best. <laughs> okay. I've some news that should brighten your day. David's words caused the king to look up from his newspaper and I, his son. That's doubtful, unless it has to do with the rumors of another war brewing in Europe. The order has been busy with its plans. And I would very much like to hear what opinions are being held about the new stirring in Germany. With a deep breath, David continued. I am to be a father. The queen slowly and gently placed her teacup back into its saucer, setting it on the side table, then turning to look at David with raised eyebrows. I knew it would only be a matter of time before this happened. Given the social life you lead, you've always been determined to do the opposite of whatever your father and I wish, no matter the consequences from the order. Your father has negotiated with them many times to keep them from interfering with your livelihood. They say he should put Bertie on the throne, since you won't behave like a proper future king of England. They have even considered your illegitimate older brother, Adolf, but instead, they have decided to groom him for other purposes. Okay. RJ Bachelor, how are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you? Very good. Now, this is a first. You know, I've, I've interviewed a lot of authors who've allowed me to narrate their books and turn them into audio books. But usually, when I get round to doing that, it's when the book's done... And it's the first time I've actually met them. But with you, it's different because we've already met in London. Yes, we did. Um, it was pretty exciting for me also. I've never worked with a producer that I met in the beginning or a publisher. So, yeah, this was a pretty so big deal. We had, uh, we had a nice lunch at the Sky Garden overlooking the Thames. It was nice oh, in, the, yeah. in a building, if you know London, the one that's got the nickname is called the Walkie Talkie the building and if you've never been up to the sky garden it's worth checking out uh, wasn't much of a view the day we were there it was london so it was raining <laughs> so, yes it but, was. but still ruined all my photography but that's okay <laughs> that's okay but it was still nice and it was it was nice to meet you so what were you doing in london then because clearly you're not from london no i uh i usually spend um oh gosh three months if possible, in London, because I work in the British Library sometimes looking at old documents for future manuscripts and books I'm writing. Uh, also with the National Archives, I look at a lot of the very old documents. I read Old English, so I uh, transpose some of the information. It helps with my uh, effective storytelling as well, but I uh, love history. Absolutely love it. So it made the trip a tax write-off? Absolutely. <laughs> and so how do you get access yes. to that, to go into the National Archive and the British Ar Library? Do, do you have to get permission ahead of time, or can, can anybody just walk up and go and read about oh, British history? It, it, it took me two years. I don't know if it's just because I was from the United States, but they do a background search. They do a lot to bond you. I had worked for colleges for 12, 14 years, so I had a little bit of background uh, bonding already. And um, this, the British Library was the step one. And once they, uh, you get approved security wise, you go in and there's, you've already been tested with the rules and regulations. So uh, you know that you're not gonna touch certain things. And uh, there are some with gloves you can, but that takes real high clearance. And like I said, it took a couple of years to get to that point. Um, during COVID, that was challenging because I couldn't go in at all. Doors were locked, so we did everything online. I came into London, and they didn't know when the first year they were going to open, so I stayed for several months 
and worked from the computer, they would open up certain um, areas for me to have access th to online to look at documents, packets. And uh, it was it was challenging because I was looking at the letters of uh, um, Queen Victoria to Nicholas II and their correspondence. And um, they only give you so many, like 50 packets, I mean, 50 letters in a packet. And there was over 500 packets. So it was a... Uh, wow. It was challenging, but that's for the next book that I'm working on now, uh, The Lost Star of Russia. So, Okay, now The Lost King of England, do you just want to tell us what the book's about then? Um, it's, it's a story that corrects what we thought we knew about history, and that would be the history of uh, King Edward VIII, uh, why, after his first 10 months on the throne, he abdicated the throne. Uh, why he did it was not what we've been led to believe. Uh, it was not to marry Willis Simpson, a uh, twice divorced American that, uh, you know, she was uh, conveniently working with the government. So they kind of tied her in with him and said that's why he had to abdicate for his love of her. And uh, that's not the truth and uh, not according to documents and actual uh, interviews with uh, certain members of the, I'll say the royal family, so. But doesn't he say in the famous radio speech that he gave up the throne for the woman he loved? And he did, but it wasn't Wallace. <laughs> okay, and and what would it mean? I mean, we've just got a new king now as we record this. It's um, right. Yeah, what would it mean right now for Britain if this came well, out? If, if, if Edward the Eighth, King Edward the Eighth, had um, not been forced to abdicate, uh, his living heir would have been on the throne instead of Elizabeth, but. As it turns out, and she was, um, it would take proving that there was an heir, a legitimate heir of Edward VIII to even be considered in uh, as uh, the rightful um, king, which it could be done. They had to change some of the uh, government documents. Elizabeth did that because there's certain things that if you... Uh, do not follow Parliament's appro approval. You cannot marry who you want if you're a prince or would-be king. It has to be all approved. The first six in the line uh, to um, take the throne has to have approval of Parliament for whoever they marry. They can't do it. And the conditions were that if you didn't abide by that, um, you would no longer be allowed to be in line for the throne. Now, Queen Elizabeth took care of uh, amending that in 2000, and uh, I think it was 16. Um, she had started it in 2013, so that Charles, who had originally decided to marry Camilla without approval, uh, full approval of everyone, and it was sort of a delayed thing, and she made sure they uh, uh, changed and amended that particular uh, document that had been in place since um, way back in the 1600s, 1700s. So they, they did alter it so that now it does not keep any of the children of Charles or Charles himself because Parliament did approve of Camilla and him. And so therefore it legitimized that marriage where originally it was a pro going to be a problem because um, they wouldn't take uh, he couldn't marry a divorced woman, which, of course, Camelia had gone through, and they had to do some amendments, which they did. And so Charles is now the king, legitimately the king, because uh, Queen Elizabeth did make sure that all the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted. And, but at um, the time of Edward VIII, that hadn't been changed. And no, the book, it hadn't. So he the, the book says there was an heir that he did have a child with somebody else that Edward VIII did, and it wasn't Wallace Simpson. That's right, and it was not approved by Parliament, which was one of the reasons that 
he had no choice if he was because they couldn't he couldn't have an heir he could sit on the throne but he couldn't acknowledge his marriage because it hadn't been approved by parliament and he couldn't approve any heirs that had come out of that marriage which again was not approved by parliament the heir could not come to the th throne and demand his rights uh, until that was changed which it eventually was what queen elizabeth did was open pandora's box when she was able to alter that for Charles and Camilla, so he could uh, have a queen and marry a woman that was divorced, and uh, and with Parliament's approval, they finally did do all that. But yeah, it's kind of a it's a, one of those now a son of Edward the Eighth could come forward, he could come or a a grandson or anyone could come forward and say they have a legal right to the throne, but. Um, it would have to be backed. He would have to be backed by quite a few uh, political factions as well, because he he would fit the bill for the royal standard to be there. He is not a Catholic, which was one of the rules. Uh, could not marry or be Catholic to sit the throne of England, and uh, he would definitely um, have a right to go forward now if there was one, as the book states, and. Um, it would be a very good time for that uh, particular information to come out and uh, to be questioned. So, yeah. So if this, if, if there is an heir, as the book suggests, because it's a cracking read, um, reading, narrating it was was so much fun because it takes the author of the book back to that. Well, they come to London, but they go back to their home in Colorado. And then they are, they're kind of, is it, would it be MI6? Who were the people that were chasing the author of the book? And is the author, is the author of the book based on you? Well, I have a really good imagination. <laughs> okay. So okay, okay, maybe okay. it is. But, but you, do, well, do, who is it, who is it that's, that's trying to, to keep the secret then? Because there are some pretty, there's some pretty heavy stuff goes on along the way in the book. Yes. Yeah. Yes, um, it involves, I mean, whenever you're dealing with a monarchy or anything royal, it involves the uh, political factions. It involves the monarchies. Uh, Her Majesty's Secret Service is a real thing. Um, they are the closest to the royal family, especially the king or queen. And uh, they were definitely involved in that, as well as there would be MI6, and I suppose, you know, MI5 is a little older and evolved into MI6, but there are some that have served for both. But yes, there were several factions that were involved in um, this uh, story. And uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it was all surrounding Her Majesty and uh, the groups that she answers to or that look after her or the entire royal family so now i don't want to give too much away for anyone who's not either read the book or downloaded the audiobook version but what can you tell me about according to the book about the person that should be the king now instead of king charles the third uh he is legitimate a legitimized, I mean, he is totally a legitimate heir of the line and bloodline of Edward VIII. But he's not aristocracy. He did not, he was raised secretly, like so many royals through Europe between World War I and II. Um, and even afterwards, there are so many royal princes and princesses that have been hidden because of the threats from a, we'll call it a one world order. Um, also from other governments, uh, other factions wanting to come into power. So there's very many that were uh, forced to abdicate kings and queens before World War II by the German Nationalist Party that was trying to have force all of the European countries to join them as a, as one big uh, nationalist party. 
and uh, so many of them under threat were uh, forced to abdicate, and half of them were murdered, poisoned, killed afterwards, but most, all of them got their children out, hidden in other countries around the world. And this is kind of this whole Lost King series that I'm doing. Starts with Edward the Ace heir and uh, heirs, more than one. And um, it goes, to, uh, the next book will cover the Russian Revolution and the fall of that empire and the hidden children that supposedly all and everyone was executed, the Romanov family. And the uh, truth about that is coming as well because of the survivors that have contacted me and given me some interesting information. So. Because they were they were related to what is now the British royal yes. family, weren't they? Yes. How, the, how uh, worried are you then um, <laughs> if someone starts taking this book too seriously for your own safety? Well, the book sort of explains a story about the main character and her obstacles and fears and things she had to overcome and deal with and uh for me yeah these truths that come out uh, they're fictitious <laughs> and uh at least say they're based on truth we'll say that it's a fict historic fiction but based on true stories so um that's as close as i can come to saying anything that won't put myself or my family in danger i mean it's just the way of monarchies and governments, you, you, they don't want things out for a reason. So when I find documents or find information, and yes, I weave a story to make it a lot more entertaining in some ways, but the story itself doesn't really need a lot of help. It's a, oh, it's a fantastic story, story. but it's really well written as well. You know, you keep, <laughs> you, you, you keep the, you, you keep the story going and you keep the in my case, I'm hoping the listener uh, engaged. But if somebody reads the uh, the print or, or ebook version, yeah, it uh, it really does. So, according to this book, the heir to the throne is living in the Midlands in the UK. I couldn't tell you, according to this book, at the time that yes, he, uh, this heir lived somewhere in that vicinity. That's how we wrote it and based it around yeah. and um so a realistic there's very much realistic story and and cities and towns involved in this story um um based on you know some facts that i dug up i have to weave a story but yes that was in the midlands um a little town of walsall north of birmingham and uh and amazingly the location and everything has a lot to do with things in english history where all of the royals tended to um have uh, hidden pasts shall we say or hidden secrets and it was very interesting for me to find uh, a lot of hidden uh documents and and truths and people it was just an amazing um five-year adventure my uh, just to discover everything it was it, it's hard for me to say <laughs> yeah. without giving the book away but of course we don't want to give book people because it, it's not but okay but the book the book does reveal who the king of england should be doesn't yes. it yeah. yes yes and uh there's a, a lot of information in there and i always encourage anyone that no matter what they hear and what they read they should most certainly do their own research and get in there and take what has been provided because again there's a great deal of uh truths in with the fiction and so if they do some research they might be quite surprised uh with their own fact finding and i think people this is a time of truths i think it's very important that people start looking at things as not as history is written because again we know that it's written by the victors or those in power doesn't mean it's absolute in the truth and the truth sometimes would change the balance of power and such so i encourage anyone to do that and, and just so you know i've had people that they read my book but then when they listened to you do the audio on it said oh my gosh this is this is so real life now i really really feel involved with it and so i'm 
doing this because I'm not just plugging my audiobook, but our audiobook. It's because it really helps the story. It really helps tell it in a way that people can go, wow, I can take that and actually seek more answers and actually see the line of thinking with this. So, yeah, thank you. You're the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was you fun are. to do because it was, a, well, I mean, I had to be, I had to be Edward the Eighth, and I had to be Queen Elizabeth. Um, I had to be some, some, Everybody. some character. <laughs> yeah, I had to be all the characters. It was a, it was a fun book to do. It really was. Um, well, you had some great voices and accents. I absolutely uh, here in the United States, especially, um, they're not always aware of how many different their accents <laughs> there are in the UK. And they were a little shocked, some of them going, oh, my gosh. And so they were impressed at the job you did just because you made it very clear to them uh, of the different accents that surrounded not just London and the city, but the entire uh, country. So Yeah, it was so bit. much fun to do. It was good, you know, because, you know, we did, it was, you know, the Midlands and London and there were posh people and. Yeah, and Americans too, which are the ones that scare oh, yeah. me the most when Americans <laughs> listen, because Amer I know Americans, you know, I, you know, sometimes I hear Americans doing British accents, and some of them are brilliant at it, but some of them think they're good at it and they're not, and so I always worried about doing Americans because I don't know from an American ear whether I'm close or not. Yeah. Oh yeah, you, you were very. I've, I've had more people uh, say, "Is that the same man?" I said, "Yes." <laughs> He did it all. It, it was his versatility. And they said, and, and, and like I said, that was the hardest thing I know that I thought maybe you would struggle with, but you did really well in, uh, you know, setting up the voices ahead of time and reviewing them. It was like, this is going to work. This is really going to work. You did a great yeah. job. I like to do that on books like yours where there are a lot of accents and a lot of characters. I like to get them approved first and you know i'll do one and then send it and then you'll send it back and go no it needs to be a bit more this or there was one i forget there were there were two ladies in it and i had one with a deeper voice and one with a higher voice and it soon became apparent they needed to be switched around and exactly. so we we did that and we worked on it we went back and we did it and it was it's a, it was a nice process and at the time you were in colorado but i think right now you're in vermont aren't you I am in Vermont. What are you um, doing in Vermont? Oh, again, half of my family. And I also spend winters in isolation writing um, in Vermont for its excessively cold and frigid winters. Um, it's a perfect place to just hole up alone in, in a cabin or a house. Well, and, now now and I'm, just, now I'm like, thinking The Shining. <laughs> so. Yes. <laughs> That was that was other times I've had other winters like last winter in Ohio, I was my uh, I have a, a brother a younger brother that had a, an old farmhouse that he had remodeled the inside beautifully but it was a 1770s farm with a four story barn and it was in the middle of the Mohican National Forest and you couldn't get to this four miles from anything or anybody and I stayed there to write from January through April and. That was probably one of the scariest. I thought I should be doing a Freddy Krueger or this This has got to be a creepy. I should write something quite uh, frightening because uh, it was kind of very isolated and very frightening. But uh, again, a writer takes all of that with them whenever they need to apply it. I can imagine a few incidences there that were quite scary. <laughs> so that's your process. You basically hold up for the winter and, and knock out a book. I do. Uh Depending, I mean, this is usually it's the, to get to the rough draft. Um, the last one was um, to do the research for book two, uh, The Lost uh, Tsar of Russia. Uh, because research, you have to read like, you read more than you write. And I read 30 books, maybe 26, that were different authors, different uh doctors, the PhDs opinion of what happened to the Romanov family. So you have to read everything and all the research that others have done along with what you know for a fact comes from the survivors of that family that they have told you. And you really have to put it together because there's a lot of things they as survivors were not made aware of 
that was going on between the many countries and to be involved in their story. And so that was last winter. Yeah. It just a lot of research, lots of reading and some writing, of course, but I mean, I knock out maybe five chapters of just research information woven into chapters. And then you go back, everybody has this different style of writing and I throw it. I just throw everything down into sections and it's different. We give it another chapter and knowing that I'm going to come back through, add, resort, reorganize it. But wow. I think I'm one of those writers that does just throws things together because I, I dream it. I sleep. I dream the story. I, uh, um, I do a little meditation sometimes just to clear my head so I can sleep. Otherwise, I don't sleep. I get up and I write all the time, all night. I binge on it and <laughs> in the zone, in the zone. <laughs> wow. And so what got you interested? You know, you're living in America. I assume you grew up in the United States. And yes. what got you interested in European history then? Uh, my mother used to read constantly growing up. It was my stepmother and she um, was the only mother I remembered, but anytime she could sit down from housework or garden, whatever she was doing, she had a book and she would be eating lunch and reading. And as soon as she took a break, she'd be reading. And finally, I think I was like seven or eight years old. I, maybe it was nine. Anyway, I finally asked her, what is so interesting that you have to sit there and read all the time? And so she's the one that she read history. She loved uh, ancient history, uh, early Egyptian and things. And I, she ended up getting me involved with it. And um, that was that was the exciting part for me was I started realizing there's a whole nother world out there in the very beginning of civilization as we know it and documents that were really real documents. She loved this uh, Sumerian history, the very, very early recorded history and their documents. So I had every intention of being a um, archaeologist when I was a little girl. I tried to run away and do that. <laughs> yeah. In the Where'd you of run the away? Where did you run, ar run away to? Well, I didn't. I thought I was going to make it to Egypt in the pyramids in my brain. <laughs> As a young girl, I thought all I have to do is pack a little bag and hide it under the bed and everybody goes to sleep. I can walk out the door and find a bus to it. I was <laughs> very naive, but I really got involved in history because of my mother's uh, dedication and love of historic and historic novels. I started reading the same thing she did. And then the history of England became something she was fixated on. And I did during my teenage years. And, um, and that's when I think I, could hardly wait to come to England. My family on my father's side is from England uh, in Scotland, uh, up in the north. And uh, so uh, the bachelors still are in, uh, professors at Stirling College in Scotland and a few other areas. And so my sister, she talked me into going with her backpacking England and Scotland. And we did that and had a wonderful time. And I fell in love with the UK. Felt like I belonged there. So is your mom still around? No, she passed. And in fact, we didn't backpack England and Scotland until my parents had passed 10 weeks apart. And uh, uh, we decided since dad wouldn't let us do it when we were teenagers, we'd do it a little later. And uh, that's kind of how we did it like 10 years ago. So it was <laughs> it was a great adventure. My sister is a journalist. Um, I mean, she taught journalism in high school uh, for years and years. And so we have a few similar love of literature, love of, um, of, of reading bookworms. And uh, I just loved history. I fell in love with the history of things more. So what do you think your mom would think of this book? <laughs> She'd say, why, why am I not in it? <laughs> <laughs> or why am I in it? One or the other. However you want to look at these okay, characters. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is a fabulous, it was a, it's a, I can tell you, it's a fabulous read because I've read it, obviously. Uh, I think it's a good <laughs> listen too. And it was so much fun to do. And it was great to meet you in London before we worked together. It was weeks before we worked together. And uh, we just talked about it and talked about the, 
the uh, the background to it and everything and i found it fascinating and uh, and then we got to work on it together and it was it was just such a lovely process going through it and doing it stage by stage getting the characters right and the voices right uh, and now it's an audio book it's called the lost king of england and it's by rj bachelor who i know as becky I don't know if i should say that uh and it really is a lot of fun uh the book is there you can get it from Amazon wherever you want to get it. The audiobook is available on Amazon as well. Also on Audible. If you have an Audible subscription, subscription, you can get it for free. If you sign up, it can be one of your, your first uh, downloads. And uh, continued success. So the next book, it's about the, the czars and, and at the time of the Russian Revolution, or does it go back before then? And, and, it, and it will be linked to this one slightly because there is a the, the British royal family and, and that royal family do have... Uh, family connections, don't they? Right. Um, it, it is a law czar of Russia. is about Nicholas II, and he is the last czar that was uh, on the throne and ruled the empire before the Russian Revolution. And then the Bolsheviks, uh, the story is centered mostly around the history of um, Nicholas and his family, the Romanovs family, and the tragedy that the whole world is still trying to figure out what really happened to them. There was not a lot of absolute proofs over the last hundred and, you know, four years or five years. And um, they're finding more and more out, but there's still no absolutes. There's just, uh, they don't have, they say the entire family died and were executed. Five children, the czar and the czarina. And, um, as it turns out, again, <laughs> there were survivors. And so that's what the story I'm writing, they've asked me to do that. I will probably um, be very, very um, factual about it, but I still have to do it as a fiction. Russian government's really not wanting all of their facts out. So uh, I have to be very considerate of their sensibilities on this. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so that's the next one. But the book to get right yeah. now is The Lost King of England. And it explains what would have happened if Edward VIII had an heir and it was not via Wallace Simpson. And also, who would be the current King of England? And it wouldn't be Charles III. It's a fascinating read. It's a lovely read. It's really well written. It's called The Lost King of England. RJ Bachelor, Becky, thank you so much. Thank you for having me here today. And uh, thank you for enjoying the book and doing such a great job with it. Absolutely the best. <laughs>